Welcome to the Rechecks Podcast. Today we are with Bobby Vitron, the founder of Micro Ego. Welcome to the podcast, sir. Let me jump straight on to the first question. We're seeing a lot of upheavals in Europe. We're also seeing a lot of uncertainty related to Brexit. In your viewpoint, how do you perceive the social political climate in EU and what can investors take from it? I think the important uh, point to make here is that I think we are in a, when we speak of cycles, we are at a, you know, a inflection point of an important political cycle. Political cycles tend to last 30, 40 years. That's why few of us have seen them really, uh, which is unlike financial cycles, which are much shorter, like say 10 years. And I think the important part is here we are flipping now into a political cycle that is economically right. So obviously Austria first, Italy first, you know, uh, we have US first, New Zealand first, everybody's first. And on the other hand, we are flipping um, uh, economically left. And that means basically, you know, fiscal policy, it means tax hikes. So I think from a trading perspective, the important uh, consideration of that mainly, I think, is actually uh, um, that it should be inflationary. Uh, purely because obviously if globalization is uh, disinflationary, then this should be inflationary. And I think the implication for Europe is very important because obviously in a political environment where the importance of the nation states goes up, it is obviously quite tricky to be a union of sovereign states. And so it is very important to see how Europe develops in the next years. Is it going to be towards further integration or towards a multi-speed Europe? Uh, if it is towards a multi-speed Europe, then obviously also Brexit will be less of a problem because, uh, because um, you know, the, the system will have to adapt to that situation. Um, that makes obviously not just Brexit so important next year, it also makes the European elections incredibly important next year because we basically will see who are the people who will have to steer Europe through this critical phase uh, in the next five years. You're a man of the world. We've discussed the, the European scenario. We've seen the markets in a very dicey position. But what's your reading of where the emerging markets are heading at this point in time? Well, obviously, emerging markets took a very big, big, big hit this year. Uh, you know, definitely entered into bear markets, especially China on the back, especially of the trade tension, but also domestically. Uh, uh, for domestic reasons. And I think, honestly, that at this stage with devaluation, definitely, I mean, having corrected clearly in the US uh, over the last uh, month, but overall, it does make sense, I think, to look at going a uh, long emerging market, especially if the Fed really is thinking about slowing on the on the, on the hiking and, and that could stop the do dollar strength, going long emerging market, and especially, I think, against Europe. Uh, long term, I, I think Europe, there's a lot of potential. But I think a difficult year is ahead. I also think that while the trade tension with uh, China has definitely been the headline, uh, the one with Europe got calmed after that Juncker meeting with Trump. I think there's a good chance that might come back, especially on cars. So I do think actually that uh, an overweight of emerging market versus Europe is something that is worth uh, considering. And yes, I do think that China, uh, especially because of having been target of the, uh, or mainly suffering of on the trade consequences, will probably um, not obviously do a, a boost, liquidity boost, as they did during the great financial crisis, but definitely try to support their markets in their obviously various ways other than just uh, uh, pumping it full of liquidity. You can do tax cuts, uh, uh, measures which support domestic consumption. So I do think it is a, a definitely an interesting time that if you don't want to go out uh, outright long emerging markets, definitely against uh, uh, Europe is is I think probably a good is a good idea for the next year. You've been you've been in the business for decades. You you realize that volatile times like this, uh, a lot of investors tend to flock into gold. Now, for starters, let me ask you: Are you a believer in gold? And if so, how much of your portfolio allocation would you make to gold, given things as they stand right now? From a pure portfolio location, I would definitely own five to ten percent in that area of of gold. Um, what makes me interesting of gold is that I'm a natural contrarian, and many people now have given up on gold, um, and that is fully reflected in the level of volatility. So, what I actually really like is is to own, uh, for example, gold calls. If you have them as part of your port of portfolio as hedges then, then um, it is a very relatively cheap insurance to own. Um, uh, and look, uh, at the end of the day, where, you know, the reason that gold vo uh, implied vol is so low is because the price hasn't been moving or hasn't been as exciting as people would have thought. But that's a little bit like with everything. I, I have been all this year um, uh, worried or uh, thinking that, you know, going long vol is a good idea. 
And, uh, and uh, we look, when the VIX was below 10, everybody was saying, oh, there's a reason it's below 10. And it's like, yeah, but it doesn't mean it won't, it will be stay down there. And obviously, like, you know, VIX, equities, all has played out. Um, if gold is one of the attractive vaults. So gold in itself, I think, in times like this is worth allocation in a portfolio. And I think, again, as an overlay, owning calls on gold is a very uh, pricing, from a pricing perspective, attractive uh, position to have. No conversation of this nature would be complete without discussion on Latin America. And we've had loads of developments there, especially the Brazilian elections. And we also see that the Argentine government is facing a very tough time. So looking into your crystal ball, where do you see the LATAM markets going? Um, so Brazil is an interesting case because um, I definitely had it right there that into um, into the Brazilian election, I was uh, that the mar- bullish that the markets would perform quite well because of Bolsonaro. And uh, it's obviously not so much Bolsonaro, it's more Guedes, the, the uh, you know, expected finance minister, and uh, I would say his attitude to reform. Now, it's, uh, the, the risk is obviously what happens if Guedes falls, or will he be able to uh, put through the, the reform um, that he is planning to. And I think as long as somebody like him is in the finance ministry and the willingness to reform is there, uh, that should be quite positive for Brazil. Um, having said that, the fact is that clearly the the government of Bolsonaro is a bit split between those with a military background who, to be honest, have been big beneficiaries of the current, for example, pension system. So I'm not exactly 100% convinced that they will vote against it. Um, uh, and on the other hand, the finance guys who are very much, uh, you know, see the need to reform it. Overall, though, I have to say, you know, there has been such a big, um, I would say, you know, flash in, in, in Brazil ever since the Lava Jato uh, scandal that it is definitely, I think, a, a, an opportunity definitely lo- worth looking at. Uh, with, but, uh, with Argentina, uh, I'm a big fan of President Macri. Um, having said that, he obviously has important elections coming up next year, and that constrains a little bit his ability to actually pursue reforms, which are obviously necessary. Um, uh, uh, having said that, one possible strategy is to already announce his successor uh, so that basically he doesn't even have to run. Uh, if he does something like that, then I would be very bullish uh, uh, Argentina. But uh, uh, look, overall, I would say Argentina will clearly benefit from a strong Brazil. Um, and uh, overall, we have, I would say, a setup in, in LATAM that overall looks very constructive. Biggest worry is obviously Venezuela. And it's the fact that obviously if that system collapsed, we would get a big uh, uh, migration wave into, which we're already seeing, but it would be into Colombia. And that would, uh, that would makes me a bit cautious, the Colombian market. But, uh, but overall, uh, if it wasn't for Venezuela, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, investment uh, area at the moment. And finally, closer to home, uh, there's a lot of market chatter out there that regardless of where Brexit goes, uh, the market is, the futures market is looking at a Bank of England rate hike of at least 25 basis points by the second quarter of 2019. So where do you think on the general direction, the, the pathway that the Bank of England is likely to take from here? I actually think with, with regards to Brexit that, you know, that the, 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 well, the market is pricing in about one hike, um, by in the second half of next year. And I think it's might be underpricing, uh, because, um, obviously if we get a, let's say a deal done on Brexit, then I think a hike is necessary, uh, in this country with unemployment where it is and with, uh, with, um, with, uh, um, you know, savings rate where they are. Uh, having said that, though, if I think there is a not bad chance of a, of a no deal, but what I mean is an organized no deal, not a, not a chaotic no deal, because I don't think that is in anybody's interest. Um, and an organized no deal, though, would still require the BOE to be uh, supportive for the currency, which would mean a rate hike. And so I actually think what is more interesting is not the fact if one hike, but when? And I think it could be earlier than the markets expect. So I think actually, you know, paying uh, f- uh, or positioning for a hike in, in the first half uh, or certainly in the second quarter is uh, is an interesting proposition. Thank you very much for your time, sir.